back to The Source. I am your host, Joshua Warner, and today we have a super special guest I'm really excited about. All the way out here from Vancouver, uh, this is Ryan Fisher, actor, comedian, performer, uh, man of many faces. One of those faces being the very popular, widely known character, Dandy, uh, of internet fame and live theatrical show fame. And thank you so much for being here. Uh, thanks, Josh. I am so, so excited to have you. Um, we'll, get, we'll get into some of the dandy stuff. Uh, a lot of you guys know um, you were introduced, uh, a lot of our viewers were introduced to dandy through this comic book, uh, Dandy Presents Penny Dreadfuls, mm. um, which was a partnership that we did with Ryan, uh, the creator of this character. And uh, we were just thrilled, and it was super fun, and uh, it was something that we did to kind of celebrate Pride Month and also uh, shine a spotlight on LGBTQ plus creators and uh, get some new, uh, some new talent under our wing that we hadn't worked with previously. So I was really excited to work on that. Uh, but more about that later. Let's talk about about you and and what all you do because you are a busy, busy person. Yes. Uh, well, primarily acting focused. Um, I, I moved to Los Angeles. I lived there for almost ten years, doing film and TV. Studied theater when I was in college. And so live performing is always great, but to make a living, you got to get in front of the screen. And uh, honestly, I guess it could get summed up perfectly in the sense of um, like the, uh, there's a certain way that I look on camera that tells a different story. You know, you have a you have the, the wonderful cheekbones and broad shoulders. So people are always saying like, oh, we can put him as like, you know, and when I was younger, the football player. <laughs> or, or they're like, you're the love interest and like I can see the romance, the love story of this pretty boy and like the, the woman that he's in love with. But whenever I open my mouth and like show who I am and my personality, it doesn't always match that. And so, you know, I love film and TV. I've done some amazing uh, credits with some of my favorite shows like American Horror Story. Uh, there's always that intersection with queer and horror. Uh, Definitely. The, the Midnight Club that just came out on Netflix. Yes. Um, so that's sort of like my genre, I think, that they like me in. But it wasn't until I, uh, you know, invented the character Dandy where the outside sort of matched the inside for the first time. And I think that that's just a lesson on authenticity. Even though it's fake, I think social media, he's doing really well on social media because it's all about that authenticity, seeing something that's real. Even if it's a fictional character, there's something about how that's matching that um, you can kind of just tell in an instant. And so... It's no wonder that the career is sort of built up to that. And as you know, creating your own content is absolutely key to success in anything. You know, I, I wish I was the sort of person when I was younger, you know, I'll just wait around and I'm good, I'm talented. I, right, I, I roles was, will come. They'll yeah. come because I'm good, you have to be good, but it's just not enough to do that. It's also being smart and creating things on your own, and so that's sort and of... And I do think, so what, while you were simultaneously tackling... Uh, live theater performances, you were going to all these different auditions in Hollywood, you were getting cast in these huge shows, um, which is all amazing. You were simultaneously building up a big web presence through web series as well, which yeah. I think might have kind of helped lead to this as well. So yeah, like the, the spinoffs is a great example. Yeah, yeah, openly um, Jake. Yeah, so, uh, so those who weren't familiar with the spinoffs, can you give kind of a little premise of what that was like? Yeah, it, the premise was um, having a multi-channel network that was all kind of um, orchestrated and puppeteered together. So I, I was an actor. I auditioned for a web series where I played a YouTuber. And so the spinoffs is a web series of a story of five YouTubers living together. But what made it sort of, and I love this sort of live theater element to it, it was an immersive experience because we each then had our own five different channels for right. our own niche little thing. To support this one web series, you had to have multiple web series so that you were built, and then you had to have social media as those characters. Mm -hmm. So this was like, uh, it's like a faux reality TV in a sense. It Exactly. And that was the, the amount of vibe. effort and work that had to do to maintain that character, you, I mean, you were practically being this Jake character like 24 hours a day and yeah. interacting with fans all the time to Always, keep it yeah. 
Because otherwise it, it didn't work without that, right? right? Which is a ton of effort. That, that authenticity that uh, is what social media is all about. And especially YouTube, if you're following a YouTuber and following their life. So there was always that disconnect there a little bit. And right. I think with the Openly Jake character, what a wonderful production. I and loved working with You got them. to bring a lot of yourself to the character. Exactly. There's some of that authenticity starting to show through. And, and that's what showed its success. Jake was by far like uh, being published in a ton of queer news outlets almost immediately. Uh, the, the, the higher ups back we're the creatives but the higher ups in production are like oh, we're really figuring out something that works here and it was that um, that I got to bring you know LGBT activism things that I really cared about to the character in the series and the videos that really pushed it all towards the same direction I thought it was brilliant i thought everybody on the show was brilliant yeah i thought it was incredibly real it was really easy for fans to buy into this and and many of them did they thought that jake was a real person I mean, that was probably the only thing that couldn't have longevity is that you have a career outside of this character and you're recognizable so people are gonna be like wait a minute who is that guy it, because because part of the the role was not giving away that it's that it's I don't want to say fake because I mean it's acting, it's a show. But but yeah, it, it, part of it was keeping up that that appearance of this whole second identity, and um, you can only do that for so long before people start to kind of you know see through it and start viewing it as a role, and it starts changing their perception and their take on it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But that did allow you to start getting to be a little bit more of yourself on camera, and then I feel like may have had some sort of hand in you doing your own web series and writing your own sketch comedy and that's it has uh, leading into enemies of dorothy which i think was there any overlap or was that after yeah enemies of dorothy was born completely out of exactly figuring out that the lgbt theme was again it's a very creative thing that comes from my heart but if you break it down into like business it's like that niche audience is what you want to tap into. Sure. So it's like I, I know that there's that audience there. It's the same people. There's meaningful work there, but at the same time, it's like, well, we need the numbers. We need the audience. We need people to view it in order for it to be, uh, to grow and be a successful business. And so when we were thinking, you know, comedy was my thing and uh, making it queer comedy will get us right to the top of this specific niche of it. And so it was born directly out of the Openly Jake success. For and sure. you, were you surprised at some of the success that Enemies of Dorothy had? So for those who don't know, Enemies of Dorothy was a, uh, was a web series um, that was, was sketch comedy and some of those bits just blew up. I yeah. mean, they became viral hits, but then also got second life elsewhere. I mean, some of this ended up on, on networks, right? Yeah, Here TV is a LGBT network here in the U.S., and uh, we sold two episodes to them. And yeah, it was the Darling of Outfest, which is the third largest film festival in Los Angeles, and it's the queer theme festival. And uh, we got an Encore Award, and we screened a bunch of them uh, there. And I don't think it was very surprising, to be honest. I... I what I do to this day, and my least favorite part about my live shows is that I can't buy a ticket to sit down and watch it. <laughs> and so I think that's always been, and I learned that from doing Openly Jake and the spinoffs, having the luxury of creating whatever I wanted so early on in my career and, and developing my voice and being a producer, it, it, it sort of spoiled me in that sense. So with Enemies of Dorothy, I was like, this is what's missing. And I think that's another, again, there's a lot of heart to that, but there's, uh, it's a good business move. And it's like, there's nothing on TV like this. I want to create what I want to watch on TV, so I'll make it because it's not there. And uh, of course, there's like predecessors of the big gay sketch show, um, the, lots of great queer sketch comedy that's been created. Uh, but it, the, nothing notable, really, beyond like if you do your research and find these um, other examples. So, yeah, I think that that was a big part of it is just creating like what I want to see. And so, when it was successful, I was sort of like, yeah. Right, guys? Like, that's good, right? And it's a, an original. And so, yeah, Enemies of Dorothy was an amazing time. And, and, and it sort of tied in a nice, neat little bow when the production team sort of broke up and we were moving on to do other things. It was just sort of like, we achieved that. Okay, like, we could keep going and try to 
bust the budget and do right. more. And it's still there. There's still an audience for it. Um, and but that actually did directly lead into Dandy, the uh, one of the. Um, uh, for when we sold it to the network, we had to edit it into a half hour episode versus just like five minutes right. videos. And so they uh, have commercial breaks on TV. And so to come in and out of commercial breaks, we had to film a couple things. And one of our concepts was like queer famous characters. And the like dandy and the fop was this idea. It's not something I invented, it's always been in the queer canon. I love people discovering it through Dandy, but so we had these costumes and uh, me and the other producer dressed up as fops and it was just a photo shoot basically. And so then we had this, these costumes. And so that bled directly into when I was creating queer content for um, the cabaret scene. Um, you know, I was starting to do a lot more live performance. We had had our little crown jewel of the success of Enemies of Dorothy, and it's just that kind of time in a creative's life where we're just seeing what's next. And so I'd never sung on stage before, and I was 30 years old, and I was like, it's time to get over this. I love musicals. And I joined a cabaret group that was a mashup of two very queer musicals, Rocky Horror and Hedwig and the Angry Inch. And so I was like, if I could do a shower concert or like a Broadway road trip belting moment, it would be to either of those. I know every word, every note. I could sing those on stage. And so I got cast in the cabaret, had an amazing time, and then the company um, was very supportive. They were loving Enemies of Dorothy. They think the queer activism that kind of goes behind it, uh, just politically charged just for being queer, uh, was great. And so they said, uh, please work with us again. We, you can have two eight-minute act slots. Uh, just come up with an act. And I was like, well, I have a costume. And so if I'm going to sing in earnest, you know, everybody's singing in these cabarets. So it's like, if I'm going to sing a song, it's going to be a, a old Victorian ditty, something where, like, you know, it's not hard to sing. Right, and yep. I'll wear a ton of makeup and costume, and that way it's not Ryan singing, it's Dandy singing, it's a different character, a different guy, I'll do a silly voice, there's a whole persona. And that like shielded me in a way sure. <laughs> from having any responsibility of getting in front of this audience. Um, but it was at that point just like a perfect storm of skills that I had learned in theater school. Like I wanted to be the like young ingenue that they thought I was, but instead I would get cast as roles like the narrator. I'm like, this, <laughs> I'm paying for theater school. I want to learn how to learn lines and act and deep b build a character instead of playing this sort of uh, omniscient uh, narrator who will like go out to the audience and lock eyes with the audience. And I'm like, this is stupid. This isn't what. <laughs> this isn't theater to me. Theater is like put up a fourth wall and. Uh, but little did I know that while I was like Ugh, so disappointed, these were skills that built up over time of just what I was naturally good at, what the people producing it were like, that, that's good for you. And uh, ultimately grew into where I had the costume. And I said, you know, my strength is going to be, I got eight minutes to fill, so my strength is going to be the comedy, the character. Sure. And this uh, obsession with, like, British TV and British humor, my whole life, Monty Python, absolutely fabulous. The, the characters there I, I would do as a child, just constantly this theater kid who's so obnoxious, belting Rocky Horror and doing a British accent all the time. The most annoying <laughs> queer little child, but we love him. And uh, so I was like, all right, I'll do this character, but base it sort of on Oscar Wilde. Like, I've got this foppy look. What's funny about that, and that's the same joke anybody makes in that costume, is how masculine these men thought they were with these big powdered wigs and showing off their calves. is like a sexual prowess. So, so they're very virile. <laughs> but uh, Oscar Wilde had this green carnation club the, the, where they would all wear green carnations as like a tell to each other at the, the any sort of soiree that that person's gay without saying gay and so I sort of stole that idea and lavender is a very queer coded color and so 
uh, I made little sprigs of lavender. I was like, I'll just do the whole bit with when the audience comes in, I'm going to hand these out and I'm going to say it's a secret meeting for the secret society. Already the audience is like involved. Um, the, it's, it's for you. You're here. You're in the play. So you're going to sit down, but like you're in the meet, like we're in it together. And so even if I stand on stage and say all the lines and sing all the songs, you're also a character here. And so people love that. Yeah, uh, the, the immersion, the interaction. Oh, yeah, you're going to a cabaret. You're, you're, that's you're an event. You're loving getting the burlesque woman to come up and talk to you. Right. right. Uh, maybe this is a shy to be pulled on stage, but they love to be engaged. Uh, exactly. That's why the people that go to that sort of thing love it. And uh, so I brought them up, and that was the first joke. It was just a joke about... You're the Lavender Society, right? And they're like, heck yeah. And you know what that is, right? That's a secret club of gay people. And they're like, what? <laughs> so you're so gay. So you're all gay, yeah. And they're just like, oh my God. And the, the gag was like, I don't, you're wearing the pin on you. I don't that know. Right. This, is your, this is your thing. I'm just going to run the meeting. So let's get started. And <laughs> I think that was activism. Like immediately there was just something there that no matter how, you know, on the fence the boyfriend that got dragged along to this thing is, he's laughing his ass right. off about right. it. And so immediately, you know, when Dandy was invented, it, it, it was for this act, and it was so that I didn't have, I didn't have to sing, he'll do the singing. And uh, the, 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 the theater space was re recently renovated. The tech was going haywire. Our host was a, a, a parlor host is where they found her. She was captivating in a small room, but in this huge space, she was totally lost. So everyone's like, what's the host even saying? And the, then the bearded lady who could sing opera, she, she gets to her beautiful aria, and the mic cuts out, so everyone's just like oh, drained. No. I'm about fourth in, and I come out, and everyone's sitting there like slouched down, and you just feel the room go, what? What is that? <laughs> and the notes I still get to this day is like, I, I, I'm very much more recognized now, but if somebody discovers, it's like, I did not know that that's exactly what I wanted. And so <laughs> it makes it more unique. I sort of give that answer for them. And so... You know, a few weeks later, they rearranged the cast. They kind of gave the show over to me so I could start it off with the Lavender Society bit. And it just grew and grew and grew. And over um, to lead into where we are now over the pandemic, we were all scrambling to figure out what to do with our time and our art. And uh, I was getting into Dandy twice a week, uh, enjoying myself, just building costumes and put it on TikTok. Uh, I had a, a young assistant at the time, 21 years old, and I was like, I'm in my 30s. I should not be on TikTok. That is not for me. It's not my generation. I have no interest in learning a new app. They were like, no, trust me, like, do, do a video. And I think it was the second video that got posted was like... You know, a hundred thousand followers immediately. Like the the way it that happened so fast. Yeah, and it was like, oh, okay. It was, and it was exactly that interactive thing. And so that's like a great tip for anybody getting into TikTok or creating content on Instagram Reels. It's it, there was something about Dandy looking right down the barrel of the camera, saying, "Hello, you there, holding your phone," and they're like, "Me." It's like, you're the Lavender Society. I'm Dandy. You're the friends. And it's like, instant follow. Like they, The content's created They're specifically part of it, yeah. for them and that interactivity. And I think that's what's beautiful about social media. And I think that's kind of the point. And it was an opportunity, everything from openly Jake building into the LGBT sketch comedy, building into cabaret live performance that just sort of was a perfect storm. And I work in cabaret now in Vancouver at the Rio Theater. And uh, it's a wild, chaotic, beautiful time. But also on the side, I'm building up like a little following in an empire and a community of performers there. And then I just post something stupid. And you never know which one's going to hit. But like the ones that interact the most, that get the clear message at a branding coach um, a friend of mine that I sort of knew kind of in passing, but just the loveliest people when we ran back into each other against like the last bout of growth and viral videos. 
um, they were like, you know, I use you as an example in my class now. It's like, I know this guy, and here's what works. He has a very specific message, very specific, and he says it again and again and again in very different and clever ways, but it's literally the same thing that he's saying again and again and again, and that's why people follow, and that's what people are interested in it's, it's true the brand it's very specific it is the message is always the same and coming everyone knows the punchline to the joke but Absolutely. the joke setup is always different yeah and people love it because i think there's an element of knowing what to expect from your content that make people feel comfortable yeah right out the gate they know what they're in for and they're already smiling before you've done the funny thing how many um so it, this has led to a massive following, like hardcore fans, merchandise, comic books. And book. comic books. Um, it's really incredible. Out of this group, so obviously it's, it's turned into this very safe space where people have very much opened up to you. There's people who've come out of the closet to you because mm -hmm. of this. And I think, I think what it's doing for the community is absolutely incredible. Um, but being as outwardly gay content as it is, uh, what percentage of your followers do you think are uh, cis straight people? There's a good tension. There's a good amount, right? A I, surprisingly large amount. A very large amount. Yeah. Well, the analytics will tell you too. Like it's mostly women that follow me. Mostly straight women in their like late twenties, early thirties, and I think <laughs> there's just something about how comforting and opening it open it is that gets that, but. I think that's the joke, too. And at this point, there's enough of a following where they explain it to each other. Somebody will comment on every video and be like, I'm a straight cis woman, can I join? And somebody's like, yeah, but you're gay. Yeah, you're right. Like, yeah. But you're gay here. Like, that's, the, that's the joke that's going on. And I love when straight men will comment and say... I was just, I just stopped scrolling to look at your amazing outfit, but oh my god, I'm gay now. <laughs> or like, my, I was like, I'm gay, and my wife is going to be pissed. And, <laughs> and I always tell them, I'm like, yes, well, show her the video, make her gay, and you'll be a gay couple. Which we love gay couples. <laughs> and so, yeah, there's a bit to it. I, but, of course, there's also the other half of society that gets very triggered by it and it's also the point and I love to I try to respond to it very little you never want to encourage because sure people lashing out on social media and you've created such a positive space yeah there's that, a, to instigate them or tease them a little bit more is just not the brand right, right. and so but I, sometimes I'll get in there and be like sound gay to me <laughs> uh, like if this is coming across you the, the, the algorithm knows better than I do I've, if you're watching this and commenting on this and engaging in this you must have a lot of gay content <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very good reason to and I love um, you know there there would be people it's been long enough now where there's a full journey where people would be like I hated you at first I hated this content and I was mad and mean about it but like it turns out I was a lesbian and <laughs> that's what was going on and now I love you and thank you for helping me on that journey kind of that's, thing and so that's amazing yeah and, and we were talking about this about um, some of the the messages that I get on there that it's are really just heartfelt, deep ones. Very heartfelt, deep ones, and a lot of stuff about being in a very dark, depressed place and just finding this shining light that like helps people. And while uh, while it's amazing and like so touching, and I'm taken aback. It's the same sort of thing where it's like, but I'm not surprised. And uh, I, I think I already shared with you this quote, but it's one of my favorite things to say right now that. It, it, it just makes so much sense. It resonates so much about Dandy. And so it is that, you know, I try to create a space where people can be themselves and a space where people can feel like they're allowed to be themselves. And people will come up to me and be like, I love you. I love you, Dandy, so much. And what they're really saying is that they love themselves. And the way that this environment creates a space to let them be that is what they love. Like, Danny's not real. It's not even a real character. It, they're shocked I'm not British. I know. It's such a, <laughs> such a good accent. But um, I think that is real. And that is something that does change lives and touches people. And um, again, it's like, of course it makes sense. Like, that's because it's not about me. And it never was. It was always about looking them in the eye through TikTok. Uh, getting on stage and walking off stage, standing right in front of somebody and putting the mic in their face. And that 
I think is like the magic of it. I think it's what is healing. It builds community. And then of course, like I'm doing this activism right from openly Jake. And my whole life, I think, being queer, as soon as I came out, I was like, you know what, like, I'm privileged. I am a white cis man, and I'm a part of this community that can lead, and I have leadership qualities from my theater training, and just You're being You're in a competent. position to help. You're in a position to lift mm -hmm. people up. And exactly. And just be like, okay, that's it's a duty, and... I love when people say, like, don't make being queer your whole personality. I'm like, I will. Uh, <laughs> sure, there, I am vast and varied, but, like, I uh, worked for a time for the Trevor Project, too, uh, which is a crisis hotline for LGBT youth in the country. And uh, the, the, it's just something that I'm so passionate about and, like, wherever I can help. And through the training of that, mixed with all of the social media presence and the LGBT-specific comedy and and content, it, it was just like, I, I have the tools to be like, okay, now I know about active listening. I know about like sensitivity around certain topics. It's traumatizing to be a queer person. So having somebody in your phone that makes a safe space for you and you're in Tennessee right now, then it is like the difference between life and death in some situations. Sure, yeah. And I, even saying that, it feels so weird to make it so precious. But, but it really is. And I think that's what uh, uh, bringing that kind of joy is a pleasure. It's so fun to be dandy. And to make a difference like that is just like another reward to all of it. That's amazing. Uh, and all of this born out of an uh, eight-minute spot that you had to fill and come up with something. Yeah. Like, what do I have and what am I good at? Yeah, just a bit of silliness to try and, yeah, perfect recipe. So what's next for, for both Dandy and Ryan Fisher? Uh, that you can talk about. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, in Vancouver, so LA's amazing. It will always feel like home to me. It was the first city that I lived in where I really felt... Like, this is where I belong. But the opportunities in Vancouver, B.C. are incredible. So I've got uh, an episode this week on a show called So Help Me Todd, which is a network sitcom. Um, and there's a ton of roles like that happening all the time. Last of Us is filming in Vancouver, so we're going to manifest Ooh, getting on yes. that. But uh, besides the film and TV work, it's just... Um, if you want to see Ryan Fisher land a spot in... The filming of The Last of Us. Use hashtag. Any sort of role. Yeah, yeah, seriously. <laughs> Drop some comments. Tag tag the network. I mean, uh, tag Pedro. He's please. right there. Yeah, I mean, he's right there in in Vancouver where they're filming, and he's one of the best and the, the, the best. Uh, yeah, Plus it fits. It fits into your catalog so well. It really does. I think they could really use a gay leader in uh, the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> but you see that sort of stuff, like the role that I had in Midnight Club. It 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 is a leader of a gay club, and so how this stuff is very full circle. The queer space in horror is one of my favorite things about horror. Oh, for sure. Uh, and that's why the Penny Dreadfuls worked so well too. Right? Yeah, yeah. We pulled into with the comic book. We did. We did these these Victorian era horror stories, these Penny Dreadfuls, with with Dandy introducing, doing an intro and an outro for each one uh, as a as a host, and uh, very much like an Elvira type character. And it was it worked so beautifully. Uh, and then even amongst like your sketch comedy, um, some of the stuff that was horror leaning uh, hit. So well, like the, you, so the um, the Pennywise and Babadook sketch. Mm, we love the Babadook gay that, icon. <laughs> that was huge, right? Yeah. I mean, that that thing was was everywhere. Um, in fact, I I've, I've seen so many things that stole from it or borrowed from it or yeah. referenced it um, that you know, a, tried to make the joke honor. out of it after yeah. after seeing that sketch. Um, but yeah, there's um there horror has a great uh, a yeah, great I, community for especially you know for queer space. For sure, I think the um, the agreement is that like we can identify with like you know the final girl who is bullied by everybody, and uh, there's always like the jock and the beauty queen that get murdered first, but then the the sort of odd like uh, survivor at the end. We we definitely identify with her, but we also identify with like the monster, the villain too, of like this being misunderstood, this rage that you get for not fitting in, and that sort of cathartic point of both of them. Like, and Freddy Krueger, 
a drag queen for sure. <laughs> Nothing about that that's not a drag character. Like that's my point. So yeah, I think it fits well into the horror space. I've always loved that intersection. And upcoming performances? Any live performances people should know about? Yes. So um, I mean, what you're saying is next is a, a ton of pro obviously like the trajectory is going to be whatever is happening next. A lot of really cool, exciting things happening there. I can have a brag moment now that all the auditions are done and I know this is not happening. I will still brag about it, but having America's Got Talent, reach out to Dandy and be like, we'd love to see if a collaboration would work. Maybe you should uh, be a part of the show. And so like just that kind of recognition, getting celebrities to follow on social media, it's, it's like on this trajectory. But if, uh, if I could live the perfect life, it would be exactly what I'm doing now, is my full-time gig is producing these shows at the Rio Theater and um, just creating, I mean, we did a dandy musical last year, and so there are hopes to do more original content like that, but these like uh, bizarre and wonderful cabarets on, on May 20th is the oddball, and so it's just all very strange themed, odd uh, cabaret, circus, burlesque, and drag uh, sort of shows. Fantastic crossover. Great crossover, all hosted by Dandy, and it's multimedia. There's sketches that play on the screen, and um, very wonderful shows like that. So I just spend the month preparing those and rehearsing, and then we go on to the next one. So we're, we're there every month through the rest of the year. That's fantastic. Uh, and then touring those shows down to Los Angeles in June, I have, uh, the weekend of the 16th, 17th, and 18th. There's a slew of shows all over the city that I'll be doing. And uh, so it's just, you know, getting a real handle on all of these. Uh, and of course, the uh, Dandemo prints that I've been selling to. Great, uh, great way to get your own dandy uh, as well. So. Uh, that's sort of just the, the machine that's chugging along for Dandy. That's amazing. That's super exciting. And what luck that you're you're in the area and that we're able to borrow you in person for this, yeah. for this show. This oh, well, of course. I'll always come to Source Point Press. <laughs> the, right to the source, they say. Uh, but the comic book is one of the things that elevated it so much. I mean, when I was telling you that when... I had some, uh, you know, frenemies in the scene uh, became full-on enemies when I got my own comic book. <laughs> they're, they're just, nobody likes to see someone with that level of success come in <laughs> to town. But uh, it was definitely something where they set it apart of, like, oh, they have a bit of a social media following. Oh, yeah, they're really talented and fun on stage. Like, they have their own comic book. <laughs> Wait, explain to me what this thing is that this person's doing. But yeah, it's perfect. Uh, That's I, I loved it so much, and you really feel his voice come out of this off this oh the page. And, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I and so so Ryan wrote Dandy's dialogue for the comic, and I just kind of edited it all to fit in on a nice panel breakdown, and it's spot on. You can't help but read it in Dandy's voice. Yes. Which is just the best part. Um, so. I think we'll probably wrap it here. Where do you? Where can people who are new to you, who haven't experienced the character of Dandy, where should they head to first? Do uh, you want to give like a list of, of stuff for them to check out? Yes, um, for sure. Well, Instagram at Dandy and Friends. Dandy and Friends. That's, that's where you'll find all the Lavender Society home. Uh, Instagram and TikTok will be that again. I'm Dandy, you're the friends. Uh, and uh, on the website, friendsofdandy.com has all of the live show links and Perfect. where I'm coming to next. And so between the website and, and the social media, you get a full dandy land. One of these days, we'll, do, we'll have you back in a future episode, or maybe I'll come to you when you're in makeup, and I'll steal you for another quick dandy um, episode. Absolutely. That would be really fun. He's, a mu he's much better company. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thanks. And thank you guys. Uh, stick around for the next segment. We have a lot more coming up. Appreciate you. <laughs>